Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, History of Medicine talk tonight. So anyone that's had um, even a passing acquaintance with uh, health sciences in Dunedin will know about the uh, Bill Trotter Anatomy Museum, medical school across the way. Um, and so it's a great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, who is Chris Smith, the curator of that museum. And uh, so he has got a great deal of inside knowledge about it and its history. So the talk tonight is the WD Potter Anatomy Museum, almost 150 years of teaching support. So please welcome our speaker, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Terence. Here's your specs. Uh, yes, thank you all for being here this evening uh, and uh, online as well. Uh, hoping that this is all coming through all right for you. Uh, I'm going to try and cram as much as I can for the next 50 minutes. There's a, a lot to go through. Um, and so apologies to those who have heard me before in other forums. Um, I hope there are some insights tonight to keep you from complete boredom. And um, I will also note too that I'm going to be working off, off notes, so my apologies if I'm not constantly uh, looking at you there. So just a couple of things before we get underway. Hopefully you understand by the title of tonight's talk uh, that there will be images of human remains and there may be things presented that are challenging to current ideas of ethics and cultural understanding. Um, I won't be doing separate warnings before each slide. I'll also use terms such as specimen, material, parts, or uh, pieces, um, amongst others when referring to human remains. These terms are not intended to dehumanize uh, or remove any acknowledgement of them having been a real human individual. I'm not an historian. Uh, nor am I trained in museum studies, nor medicine or anatomy for that matter either. Um, and so what I present tonight is as I have discovered it. Uh, it's uh, from both written and uh, oral sources, primary and secondary. I have not interrogated or tried to interpret uh, any of this information too much. I hope to simply tell a story as presented by the stories of others. With regards to the images uh, this evening that are presented, please don't record or uh, screen capture. This talk, as with other uh, OMSA history talks delivered each month, is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, YouTubers will see a slightly different version. Uh, I will edit afterwards uh, to meet the necessary legislative requirements of the Human Tissue Act and our Department of Policy around the public display of images uh, of our body donors. Historic images already in the public domain will not be edited. And uh, as we will, in a sense, be entering the Anatomy Museum tonight, I'll start with a karakia. You can see from the uh, photo in the museum doors here, we present a karakia uh, for entrance and exit, as well as having wai ora uh, for leaving the space uh, for uh, spiritual cleansing as one exits, taking one from a tapu state back to Noah. Uh, whether or not Karakia is part of your cultural fabric. It is a nice way to start, to have a moment of pause for thought before engaging in an academic process or being in a challenging environment. Uh, this karakia we use for our students in many of our teaching and learning spaces. Po hirihiri, po rarama, po o te whakaro, po o te tangata, po o te araha, te po e hiri nei i a tato, moriora ki a tato, homie, huie, taikie. So what is the Anatomy Museum? Uh, well, today, it's an active teaching uh, research resource with 150 years of development. And I put on the shoulders of giants there because of course it exists uh, today thanks to the incredible uh, people of intellect, talent and dedication over the years. And so I acknowledge uh, these people, many of whom I will introduce tonight. And I also like to acknowledge the current team of people I work with and all who contribute to the museum and its operations, both technical and academic staff, uh, students and volunteers. So an active teaching collection that we distribute to seven main teaching spaces across campus and the considerable management of it, whether through logistics, maintenance, or even manufacture of bespoke elements. Uh, some of those I noted as being novel. So for example, things like the body painting. So keeping uh, stock for, for that process, uh, ultrasound machines, that you can see being uh, in use there in that bottom image. Uh, and clothing dress-ups, as I uh, had mentioned here, which we will uh, see later. 
responsible care for internationally significant examples in the collection. So we'll touch on those uh, and a few other elements as you see there. In particular, of more recent, uh, dealing a lot with public institutions uh, with the transfer of human remains from them into our care. So uh, many of you who in the past were medical students may have had your own skeleton. Uh, so it's those sorts of things that are coming in now from uh, multi-generational elements into our collection as well. We also have um, space in the museum now where we house the, uh, some of the pathology teaching collection um, and uh, also now share in the care of that. It's quite an extensive collection. And we're not a public space, but uh, uh, I do look at it as uh, the fact that we are a taxpayer funded institution uh, and we have a tremendous gift from many people across different communities in the South Island who give themselves uh, through our body bequest program uh, for use in our cadaver dissection uh, teaching program, as well as for the preparation of uh, specimens for long term teaching. So, I do uh, try where we can to allow um, the community into our space uh, to learn about themselves. And this quickly just is uh, this year's class numbers the teaching that uh, we are involved in and the resources that we uh, provide go into these courses. Um, most of these are, are full-time courses, but for some, for example, the, uh, the pharmacy courses and some of the workshops, they're only brief, uh, you know, one or two sessions or for a weekend, et cetera. But as you can see there, it all adds up to around about 6,000 uh, odd students uh, that we're providing a resource to across those main teaching spaces, as I said. So uh, to quote, da uh, quote David Byrne, how did we get here? Well, certainly many good days have gone by. Uh, almost two weeks and 150 years ago, on the 18th of August, 1874, Dr. Millen Courtry was appointed the first professor of anatomy and physiology. You say that bit quietly. Um, he was the founding professor of the medical school. A 26-year-old Edinburgh graduate who had recently arrived in Auckland uh, and as a ship surgeon, no doubt being in the country helped his application. He was offered a 600 pound salary uh, class fees, but with no right to private practice. On his appointment, he was sent uh, back to Britain on half pay to negotiate uh, recognition from the home uh, institutions, home universities for the Otago medical course uh, and provided with a bit of cash to get some equipment. Portree needed to do this as the plans uh, at this stage were to only teach the first two years of a degree, after which the students would then have to complete at the home universities at this stage, namely uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow. So they had to be convinced that the Otago program would meet their standards. Gautry returned mid-1875, gave his inaugural lecture on 31st of May. Uh, just so happens that Saturday the 31st of May next year, 2025, is when the Otago Medical School will be in the thick of its 150th celebrations. Uh, so it's perfect timing. Uh, when classes did begin in May 1875, there were four enrollments, identities that no one has been able to establish, possibly because they were soon frustrated with the lack of action and moved into more stimulating environments. Coltry was ser seriously hampered in his efforts to teach. One of the key requirements for the two-year medical course at Otago was the establishment of an Anatomy Act, the legislation around the acquisition and use of subjects for dissection. While this was finally introduced in 1875, it took until later in 1876 for the medical school to be recognized as a school of anatomy under the act, allowing for human dissection uh, to be carried out. And I'll just point out there, the slides um, that you see in the, uh, the image there were uh, gifted to us in 1993 from Portree's great grandson, uh, uh, Mr. Ackland, who was an anesthetist in Auckland. Uh, so they were Courtry's slides from when he uh, first started his teaching. And just out of interest to the building you see there was the home that Courtry built for himself on George Street. Uh, it's now the Patties and Cream Diner and uh, an apartment. For the year of 1876, there were only two students and then one withdrew after a couple of days to do law instead. Amongst other teething problems within the school and troubles institution wide, uh, by late 1876, the Otago Medical School had one teacher, one student, one classroom and one cadaver. Continuing challenges and conflict between Courtry and the University Council saw Courtry resign a few days before Christmas 1876. So now it was one student, one room, and no staff. The fact that we made it from this point really is a miracle. 
One of the applicants for the role of founding professor at the same time as Courtry happened to be one Daniel John, DJ Cunningham. At the time, a yet to graduate medical student. Pretty bold to uh, apply for a job of professor on the other side of the world at the age of 24, yet to graduate. So upon Courtry's resignation, uh, Cunningham, now with an MD and a demonstrator at Edinburgh, was approached by the university to fill the role. But Cunningham's request for a higher salary, fees and private practice freedoms proved too rich for the university. So the job was now advertised again. Cunningham would of course go on to become a prominent name in the field of anatomy. Many of you will be familiar with Cunningham's textbook of anatomy amongst other titles. And he held professorships at both Trinity College Dublin and University, university of Edinburgh. And he'll uh, crop up again a little bit as we keep moving through. Uh, and so to the rescue, yet another 26 year old Edinburgh graduate and John Halliday Scott, second professor and the tangible start to our museum story. Scott would arrive in July, 1877, employed under the same salary and restrictions as placed on Courtry, and the 600 pound salary would remain unchanged, <clears throat> excuse me, over the 37 years of his appointment. His anatomy teaching began in 1878, as did his planning of the facilities at the new university site. So a few slides back, I showed you the old uh, hospital build, uh, office, post office building that uh, had become the university. And then they were starting to plan for where we are familiar with main campus now. Scott arranged for a dissection room to accommodate 30, a preparation room and morgue, lecture room, anatomy room for the grown collection, soon to become known as the Anatomical Museum, one laboratory to seat 15 for histology, a small office for himself. He was planning for an immediate annual intake of 15 students, but with some room to grow. In 1879, when the new quarters were occupied, Scott managed to obtain an untrained assistant in Alfred Jefferson, but only for term time. Uh, and the uh, descriptors there were as they were out of the university calendar, the classes that were being uh, advertised there. And I think it was 1881 or 82. So you can see there's already uh, explanation about the types of resources that the students were going to be exposed to. And here we just see quickly a, a, a drawing of uh, the office that uh, was to become Scott's. It's a drawing by himself. Uh, and then a, a floor plan that was uh, drawn up in 1962 from memory from a student who'd been through in 1910. So you can see here uh, the section room. Here's the museum along this long wall here a technician's room, and obviously there were other facilities as we uh, described before. So we can now see, in particular, this dissecting room uh, and these uh, next images. So uh, the illustrations, as were explained before uh, on the floor plan, uh, make note too of the uh, this uh, classical uh, presentation here that was, a lot of those were being used at the early stage for teaching. Uh, in this, Photo here, we see Margaret Cruikshank, uh, the second uh, woman uh, medical graduate and behind her Constance Frost. Uh, and this is Alfred Jefferson here. So uh, said that uh, Scott started the anatomy teaching in uh, 1878 and by 1881, uh, he ended up having to start teaching physiology as well. Here he's requested funds to allow him to do that and was also uh, awarded a grant for the Anatomical Museum. And Jefferson, uh, Jefferson's loyalty wasn't rewarded until 1882, when he became a permanent but still part-time member of staff, received a wage as assistant to the department. Scott had made the plea to the University Council and had commented, but for him, the Anatomical Museum would be in a very backward state. And then very quickly, just some other uh, slides with some, you know, some neat stuff. Uh, not necessarily formally in the anatomy museum, but in our department's collections. Um, Emily Cedarberg, the first uh, woman uh, graduate, and uh, some of these beautiful slides here that she made while in the uh, as a student, uh, dated here in uh, 1893. And then just out of interest to the tickets. Uh, so the students had to uh, end up getting tickets for entry to the classes. These ones dated 86 and 87. And then at the end of your uh, your classes, you would receive a certificate. This one is for the practical anatomy class session uh, beginning 2nd of May, ending October 31st in 1887. And uh, Mr. Morris here has dissected head and neck once very carefully. 
etc., etc. Uh, the medical school grew and new professors, lecturers and disciplines were added to the course, uh, which soon became a full four year course in 1883. In 1887, the school celebrated its first homegrown graduate, William Leddingham Christie. By 1900, 56 students had gone through the whole of their course at Otago. So Christie, you see the medal there, uh, the family after uh, Christie's passing, um, they developed a, a Christie Prize for Applied Anatomy in the department and this uh, was uh, supporting uh, the original prize that had come through from the Scott Memorial Medal. So there are two medals uh, that are awarded in anatomy, uh, one for anatomy and one is Applied Anatomy, which is more for the um, sort of the surgical application, that sort of thing. Uh, and also just a note there, the 1901 photo, um, this is the whole of the, the medical school. Uh, there is a reasonable number of women that you see scattered there, but uh, importantly too, we have Tarangi Hiroa, the uh, first Māori medical graduate for 1904, and uh, Tutere Wirepa uh, is the 1908 graduate. Uh, in 1891, uh, the Faculty of Med Medicine was established and Scott as its first dean. Funnily enough, the chairman of the hospital staff was to be appointed as vice dean. At this time, none other than Millen Courtry. Scott held this position and that of Professor of Anatomy until his death in February 1914. His least favoured physiology had finally had the funding provided for a professor to be appointed in 1905. Jefferson uh, retired not long after that same year. And here we just have a couple of uh, memorial pieces that hang in the museum uh, from back in the, uh, in the period. One from the students uh, erected in uh, memory of Scott and the other from the professors uh, with the Dean and, and professors of the medical school uh, in acknowledgement of Jefferson's um, period there. I don't know if you can read that, but it's um, about the nat uh, exceptional nature of his service given to your late chief and to the 500 students uh, he has taught and so it's signed there uh, with, uh, by Lindo Ferguson, uh, Shantalu. Uh, uh, well, I can't read it on here either. <laughs> um, um, who's that? Colhoun, Batchelor, Barnett, and Roberts. Courtry had certainly obtained uh, some basic teaching resources, especially as a necessity in the first instance, while the Anatomy Act was still being passed. Scott would then proceed with vigor and undertake growing a collection that in some respects could look like an attempt to outdo his alma mater. Uh, based on his own experiences as a student and then demonstrator at Edinburgh, Scott imported models and casts from the prominent manufacturers. So um, I don't know when I pointed out before in the old dissecting theater, the uh, classical statues. So there are quite a few scattered around here. Many of these are now replicated in our own collection. Uh, it's, but uh, rather than leaving them as white plaster, Scott um, would actually end up painting them to look like bronzes. So um, again, perhaps an attempt to um, outdo his uh, previous uh, schooling. Starting in the uh, second half of the 19th century, uh, Steger casts were a collaboration between anatomy professors at the University of Leipzig in Germany, in particular uh, Ernst Bock and uh, Wilhelm Hiss, and the local artist Franz, uh, Franz Joseph Steger. They developed several novel techniques to allow multiple dissections and casting from the same individual, producing a series of anatomical uh, representations. Scott seems quite fond of these, and from our calculations and comparing with other institutional collections around the world, it's quite possible we have the largest collection of these anywhere. Ziegler waxes, based in Freiburg in Germany, are also another well-known manufacturer of predominantly models of embryology. And again, Professor Hiss would have influence in this. While not as, as extensive as the stages in the collection, we also have several original catalogues and correspondence between Friedrich Ziegler and Scott. Additional waxes, uh, and elements of osteology came from the Tremont of Paris. Uh, even some of these waxes that you see here are built on a foundation of real skeletal material. Ozu papier-mâché creations are also another well-known manufacturer of remarkable anatomical models. Louis Jerome Ozu was a medical student in the early 19th century. And while a student, he took to creating some models to assist with his study. 
has proved very popular with both his peers and teachers. So after graduation, rather than going to medical practice, uh, Ozu started up a family business producing human anatomical, uh, zoological and botanical models, many of which are known as clastique, that is to come apart into multiple pieces. Uh, this horse here is in the, uh, the Museum of Science in London. Uh, while smaller number in the collection from this early period, a further number were added in the 1970s. This papier-mâché piece from an unknown manufacturer of this early period had been badly damaged when a mold was taken from it for the production of fiberglass replicas. Uh, Marion Mertens, a specialist paper conservator, very generously offered to repair our needy patient here, a uh, dermatome man, uh, the extraordinary results you can see. There are many other manufacturers of models and casts in the collection from this period, but for now, we'll move into uh, real biological specimens. Scott, with the assistance of Jefferson, produced quite a number of potted and skeletal preparations. Originally in glass jars, many of these were repotted in acrylic flat-sided containers from the 1950s on. This image is just a small number from this particular period as titles. And a reference here made to the collection as a whole from talks that Scott gave at the 1896 Intercolonial Medical Congress. Scott was also an artist of repute, having considerable abilities as a watercolor artist of distinction, and he'd go on to create many charts and diagrams. He was honorary secretary of the local art society from 1881 until his death, a contemporary of one of New Zealand's most esteemed and internationally recognized artists, Francis, Francis Hodgkins, who produced this painting at Scott's request. I thought while we were gathered here in the Barnett Lecture Theatre, I would also mention a reference from Sir Louis Barnett, a student of Scott's in the early 1880s, and then uh, later colleague to become Emeritus Professor of Surgery. He writes of Scott as an artist of no mean calibre and painted a splendid series of anatomical diagrams for his lectures. And as regards blackboard diagrams, I've never seen his equal for speed, strength and clarity. And as we saw before, he's also um, Keen on uh, photography, especially in those very early days, and just a couple of uh, wonderful photographs there showing you the, the uh, early period of medical school. And so the one with the snow, this is taken from his house, so Scott House, as it is known now, as it was exactly that, it was Scott's house, as were the other uh, houses there, the four first four professors. Scott was also a keen student of anthropology uh, and his collection was left to the university. Barnett also uh, mentions about this and the activities that they used to do uh, go around collecting uh, skeletal material from around the hills. Uh, and much of this would go into some of the work that Scott would uh, present. In 1893, there are some 70 odd pages of article from Scott in the transactions and proceedings of the New Zealand Institute on the contribution to the osteology of the Aborigines of New Zealand and of the Chatham Islands. Uh, it is these two areas that saw some of the greatest influence on the early development of additional resources, a substantial watercolor collection of anatomical images, many now held in the Hocken collection, an archive of New Zealand and Pacific history, and the osteological collection and other associated anthropological resources. Uh, items such as these, Casts that you see here, deformed heads from Central and South America, uh, from uh, R.F. Damon. These were purchased in 1884. And this is a letter here from Damon to Scott uh, in 1906, encouraging him to uh, buy his uh, new cast set of, of uh, prehistoric tools, which Scott then promptly did in 1907. Um, we see an Auckland artist, Mr. T. Andrews, uh, presenting uh, many photographs to Scott from his tour around the Pacific Islands and notes about the customs. Um, and from 1911 to 13, there are records of purchases of lantern slides. And again, you can see here clearly anthropological in nature. And there are even some representing the exciting find of Piltdown Man, a must for every scientist for the period. You see there's a cast there too. Um, so, um, Quite a bit of material. 
The separate display here and in the foyer leading up to the current dissecting room encapsulates most of this uh, Scott period. You can see there the Steger, uh, Steger casts, the Ziegler waxes, the Ozu papier mache, uh, Scott illustrations, etc. There's one addition here, and that is these uh, beautiful carved copies of the Ziegler wax uh, embryonic development of the heart. And these were carved by Charlie Unwin in the 1970s and supported with illustration by Margaret Ogilvie. Two people we'll meet soon. Um, but the cowrie came from the original dissecting tables uh, from the photo in the beginning. And uh, later on, Nicola, Nicola, Nicola Jackson, uh, in another uh, media form, would then produce these uh, beautiful illustrations as well. 1980. One last thread uh, to tie off before we move uh, to our next period is to talk about Henry Wyndham Maunsell. He was the uh, lecturer in surgery, 1889 to 91. He took leave and went back to the UK for some convalescence, uh, only to resign in 1893. Perhaps to alleviate some of his guilt, he donated a new text uh, and Atlas along with supporting series of casts to the school casts you see here. Uh, and these were produced by none other than Daniel Cunningham. So again, another loop through our journey. Scott was succeeded by William Percy Gowland. Uh, he had trained as a doctor in London, later worked at Liverpool University, where he developed strong interests in embryological approach to anatomy. He was devoted to the teaching of elementary anatomy, inspired many others to do research in various fields. Apart from a steward, he had no assistants, as, um, same as Scott, um, whether academic or technical. So he took immediate steps to introduce the use of suitable students as part-time assistants and medical graduates as demonstrators, a number of whom distinguished themselves subsequently in various fields of medicine within New Zealand and overseas. Uh, so some big names there. Um, so here we have, this is still um, the same dissecting room that we saw earlier, but with a clear indication of the extent of uh, some of the elements in the collection. So this was set up for a viva for the medical students. And you can clearly see the Steger cast, the Ziegler waxes. We've got um, potted specimens here, dried specimens. Many of these are recognizable and still in the collection today. Here we have Garland and Kearney, who we'll hear about in a minute. And I'm sorry, I can't remember this chap's name. Uh, by 1919, the overcrowding of the department as a result of growing numbers and then the influx of ex-soldiers enrolling in medicine after the First World War led to the decision to build the building we're now based in, the Lindo Ferguson building, so just across the road. After seven years of uh, construction, the building was finally opened in 1927, and it was here that the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons was formalized during an Australasian medical conference. Quite a number of people turned up. Uh, and you can see here, again, another reference to uh, Louis Barnett, um, given that we're in his, that's the chap there, in his uh, lecture theater at the moment. Uh, transferring the museum specimens, lab equipment, furniture, and cadavers from the old medical school was a big job. The man who normally transported cadavers for the department uh, with his one horse carrier had to be convinced with quite a lot of whiskey at the department's expense to help out on the day. And uh, Gowland prepared a paper in 1928 for the publication Methods and Problems of Medical Education, describing the new Department of Anatomy in great detail. And it was for this publication that these simplified plans were prepared. So here we see the clear outline of the museum space. Uh, and uh, this here, this lecture theatre is, is now referred to as the Gowland Lecture Theatre. The smaller one here was the Scott. Uh, this is now actually the Department Tea Room. Um, there's been quite a few changes to this area here, but the main outline of the museum still is as it is. You can see represented here in this photo. Uh, in Gowland's words, the museum, 105 by 31 feet, is provided with a gallery along three sides and here is housed the department collection of Maori and Moriori skeletons, together with casts of prehistoric bones and implements. Beneath one wing of the gallery is a room equipped with viewing boxes for X-ray films. 
In cooperation with the radiological department, students receive instruction in this subject during the whole time they're studying anatomy. So we uh, do have some of those very early film uh, in the collection still. Uh, this one here, these aren't the same period, but I put these up because I find these fascinating. It's just lovely to see twins here uh, in utero. Uh, on the ground floor are cases containing, among other things, uh, spelt holes, transparencies, dissected temporal bones, a large number of casts by Steger, and also a considerable number of casts prepared in the department, including what is probably a unique collection of casts of blunt dissections of the human brain. Short descriptions of the exhibits are placed alongside them. And then Gal uh, goes on to explain the courses that are being taught. So I've just popped them up there for you. Uh, and at this stage, we're talking about 150 to 200 students going through the department. Uh, he finishes his address with a few comments on the research being undertaken in the department at the time. Starts out, uh, serious research is a difficult matter as the time is so fully occupied in teaching. Moreover, the Department of Anatomy, being the only one in New Zealand, is very isolated. The supply of literature is not large and consequently very restricted in choice of subjects. And if we ever wondered why some of our native fauna were endangered, he goes on. During the last few years, some 25 brains of the New Zealand lizards Phenodon were sectioned and stained by various methods. And Dr. John Kearney went to Chicago to work up this material in the laboratory of Professor Charles J. Herrick. The results to date have been published in the Journal of Comparative Neurology. It's now proposed to attempt a similar investigation on the brain of the Kiwi. We still had a number of uh, preserved tuatara specimens, as well as the histology slides of the tuatara and kiwi brains. And we passed these on to the Otago Museum back in 2005. Uh, Gallen continues to go on to explain some of the other uh, research, mostly for uh, MD thesis that was going on. So we have Kearney's work here uh, of lungs, and we've got uh, Flett with the heart, uh, the cervical, uh, a sympathetic structure here for uh, Axford, and uh, he also mentions about Denny Brown and Derwood's research. Many of these uh, research projects, uh, as you saw there, were uh, involved the production of models made out of wax, and these were prepared by Thomas T. H. Kelsey, a highly skilled artist and model maker. Kelsey had been discovered uh, during the First World War. Uh, as sergeant as he was, uh, he used to model using clay from the trenches. And um, so, and you see there he is also producing quite a few cartoons uh, from his experiences. So as uh, his talent was identified, he was taken from the trenches over to um, the New Zealand Medical Corps set up in the UK uh, and was then further transferred into uh, the Sidcup Hospital set up where they were developing the uh, plastic surgery techniques for, for facial re reconstruction and the like. And so Kelsey would create uh, models representing these surgical techniques, allowing other surgeons to quickly learn and develop uh, from these. Um, and this is a wonderful piece that has ended up somehow finding its way from us back to the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, and so there was quite a bit of work done uh, during the uh, celebrations, the, the centenary of the First World War uh, in the Royal College of Surgeons with a lot of this work. Most of Kelsey's work was carried out during the early years of this new phase. Examples here, a series of dissected heads and necks copied from dissected cadavers. But in order to keep the individuals anonymous, Kelsey's modeled the faces here, hopefully you can recognize, Lenin and Stalin. Um, I don't know that he was a red sympathizer. I think he perhaps was, I was uh, hoping that they might be there on the slab. Uh, improvements were also carried out uh, on the still very young museum. Better shelving, lighting, and new museum jars were required to fill the demands of several newly established clinical departments. Gowland also significantly increased the staff of the anatomy department, and it's during this time that Jeff Howard, as a technician, and Margaret Ogilvie, initially as Gowland's secretary and then as departmental artist, Two long-term uh, members of the department first appear, Howard in 1927 for a 40-year career and Ogilvy in 1941 for a 41-year career. 
Uh, Scotsman Mr. J.C. McKench also joined the team on the same day as Margaret as anatomy steward, quite a change from his qualification as a professional sweet maker. Apparently they had fantastic morning teas. Uh, Professor Gowland travelled uh, the universities of America and Europe from 1929 to 30 on a Rockefeller scholarship, observing anatomy teaching and research. His diary has notes on research, new teaching methods for histology and gross anatomy, the layout of dissecting rooms, laboratories and museums. And at several institutions, he comments on the technique for transparent embryos, showing skeletons and the Alizarin method of staining epiphyses with bone red and cartilage white. Procedures that were adopted in the production of specimens within the department in the 1930s. This is just a uh, caricature of, of him having returned home, as uh, titled The Pilgrim, after his, uh, his uh, time away. Uh, we'll talk about these uh, a little bit later, but they were just a nice uh, space filler for now. The number of students continued to grow. And uh, with the anatomy's involvement in home science, dentistry, med science, and physiotherapy, as well as two years of medical students. Gowland had attempted to get support and additional funding to cope with this now overcrowding. And it was the last straw when in 1943, during the Second World War, the Prime Minister decreed that the medical intake would increase from 100 to 120 uh, students a year. Without support again from the University Council, Gowland resigned after 28 years of committed service. William Edgar Adams had been a student of Gowland's, graduated in 1935, and after successful roles in the department and overseas, he returned to take up the position vacated by his old professor. Adams was head of department from 1944 until 69, when he was appointed dean of the medical school. And this photo from 48 here shows many of the names that we've uh, touched on recently. So Ogilvy, McCanch, um, Jeff Howard, a uh, new academic, who we'll hear about more of coming up, of course, is uh, W.D. Trotter and uh, a young Keith Pickersgill who came in as an understudy for Jeff Howard. Um, under Adams, the number of academic staff grew even further, and Associate Professor Len Robinson joined the department in 1952, seen here with Denny Brown, uh, who we mentioned earlier as well. Uh, and there were many dissected pieces and pots that he and Charlie Unwin are listed as responsible for. Uh, Charles Unwin joined the department in 1959 as anatomy steward uh, until 1971 when he took up the role as museum preparator. He was a fine cabinet maker and craftsman with many of the pots remounted on drawed bases with Margaret Ogilvy providing the illustrations for the keys. Together, Len and Charlie uh, prepared limbs, neuromaterial and other substantial pieces. Keith Pickersgill, uh, who joined in 45 at the age of 16, was responsible for many of the plaster casts and copies. Uh, and other material prepared during his 43 years of service. Um, this was at, uh, this is actually 1978 at Charles' um, retirement. With uh, some of his legacy, as you see around him here. Um, then this was uh, some work that they also started where they've taken some of the early Thompson uh, wax material that uh, he had worked with Denny Brown and producing a lot of neurological material. These were mounted, cased, and then Margaret did these uh, fabulous drawings. 69 saw the appointment of uh, W.D. Bill Trotter, whom the museum is now named. Uh, Trotter had been a demonstrator in the late 40s under Adams and a member of staff from 48. The early years of Trotter's, uh, early years of Trotter's era saw substantial developments, not just within the museum, but department and medical school as a whole. As you see here, 1974, this is just before they started to do some major uh, structural changes to the museum, but you can recognize again, some of the, uh, the uh, quite obvious uh, models and things that we still have in the collection today. So they really got stuck into that large space, um, did some structural changes over the summer of uh, 74, 75 uh, to open up access to the mezzanine with neuroanatomy uh, section to move into this space and the provision of tutorial rooms. Museum specimens were taken out of their grand old display cases, making them accessible to the students. Heath Pickerskill and Charlie Arwen were heavily involved with this process, as was Margaret Ogilvy in her new role as full-time artist. Uh, Len Robinson took special responsibility for the museum during this period and worked with the three technicians on the production of model specimens and their keys. An increase in model purchases from commercial producers was also initiated with a number of pieces coming from the firm of Ozu, uh, from their osteology and papier-mâché collections, 
and the Nicolas Augier Roux fiberglass collection. So those images I showed you before. Uh, the Nicolas Augier Roux collection, these dissections were unusual because they were from young, healthy people, criminals who had been given the death penalty. The molds were made between the wars by Dr. Augier and Mr. Roux under the guidance of Professor Nicolas at the University of Paris. Professor Gowland had met this trio and saw their models during his time away. And it's during this period that we also see modern plastic models being introduced from many different manufacturers, as well as further casts of various items from the Venegren Foundation being added to the bioanthropology collection. Russell Barnett, so this individual here, was to join the department in 1979 at the retirement of Charlie Unwin. And he carried on the role of museum preparator with considerable achievement. With the successful development of the museum as a space and a collection during the 70s, a lot of support was given for further development of material in-house. Russell had skills and techniques from years in the commercial retail display and model fabrication trade and was very familiar working with acrylic and fiberglass and was able to continue the work that Keith Pickersgill, Charlie and others had started. Many of the old pots were repotted in acrylic and the fluid changed from formalin and spirits to friendlier liquids. Previous casts that had been made in plaster, Russell recast in more durable fiberglass, as well as copying many of the Schrager ceram ceramics, protecting them for generations to come. Uh, you can see he was also an accomplished artist uh, in his own right, as uh, most of the uh, people <laughs> seem to come through in these roles uh, and was quite capable of building uh, from scratch using all sorts of different uh, uh, media, latex, uh, et cetera, different uh, synthetic resins. The final head of department to have a significant period in office was Gareth Jones, who replaced Bill Trotter at his retirement in 1983. Gareth continued to foster the museum as a classroom and resource and in 1986. Uh, the incredibly talented and amazing Pika Newman was employed initially as a general caretaker for the collection, only for her role to develop into that of curator. She formalized a lot of the use of the space for teaching and study and introduced theme displays, uh, all the while uh, achieving a BSc in anatomy and then diploma in museum studies. Uh, most of the history as it's recorded today is thanks to her efforts during this period. Pika left this role in the early 1990s to study fashion design but to return to the department in the early 2000s to manage the histology classroom. Uh, and she continues to have a significant input into teaching resource and curriculum development in this role. And this is just some of the uh, amazing things that Fika has created over the last few years. Uh, as you can see, quite a few things in uh, fabric, <laughs> given her, her skills there. Uh, in 1984, as the German eccentric Gunther von Hagens was perfecting the plastination process he had developed, Russell Barnett gathered together enough equipment and apparatus from around the university to have a go at the process himself. After trialing the process on animal tissue, the first piece of plastinated human material entered the collection in 1985. Not this particular piece, but this is one of the um, more uh, impressive pieces that we have uh, in the collection. And we now have over 600 specimens presented in various types of uh, polymer using this process. And just out of interest there, um, this is a uh, Citus and Versus uh, presentation. So this is one of the uh, silicon pieces. In the center here, we have what's known as a, an E12, an epoxy resin slice. So we have two of our donors sectioned, um, their entire body sectioned through for this individual through the transverse or horizontal plane, as you can see there. So obviously hundreds of slices make up this individual They're around about two, two and a half millimeters thin uh, and nicely representative of, uh, of modern medical imaging. Right. The 1990s and beyond has seen further investment and growth in the main collection to cope with the growing numbers of students across the many disciplines. Resources such as plastic models from the likes of SOMSO, as you see here, so this is another German company, uh, new vascular casting techniques introduced uh, by a previous uh, anatomy science student, Greg Jones, who's now a professor in the Department of Surgical Sciences. And old teaching uh, uh, skeletal material coming to us from community institutions, as well as being prepared uh, from our donors, so uh, our own preparations. 
As from the days of Scott and throughout this journey, artistic skill is still an integral part of our resource production process. Uh, here we have a staff member who uh, is uh, not with us anymore. He's now uh, at the University of uh, Singapore. Um, Vivek was uh, able to produce some magnificent resources for us. So this is a, a hand-drawn piece. It's quite large. We were able to then put a plastic cover over it and the students are able to go around and label each of these um, vessels and then we can quickly rub it off. Uh, he likewise drew this and then with a little bit of digital manipulation was able to produce this uh, fabulous drawing. The centerpiece is from uh, Rob Robbie McPhee who is an artist in the department for some time. He just retired recently. Uh, and again, you can see where uh, he also, from being a traditional artist, has transitioned into uh, the digital realm here. Another modern approach uh, that we've uh, just started to, to uh, use is 3D printing. And here we have an Ozu uh, papier-mâché ear, one of only a few that exist in the world. And so in order to protect that, but to still be able to use it for teaching, uh, I CT scanned the ear and we were then able to take that CT scan and reproduce uh, 3D printing. Unfortunately, because of the, uh, some of the metal um, uh, framework for the ear, of course, that gave us a, a scatter effect and some of the uh, CT created a lot of noise and it was a little bit difficult to digitally uh, clean up. So there was a considerable amount of work that Louisa Bailey, uh, a previous uh, preparator that we had, uh, that she put into having to clean up the 3D print. But as you can see there, beautifully painted uh, and uh, a wonderful replica of an original piece. A current staff member, uh, we uh, produced here for uh, Yusuf, a uh, mannequin that uh, is uh, presenting the angiosomes. And then just to finish off with another piece of Nicola's, a uh, fabulous piece here, the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So we do, do have artists uh, that also come in and, and produce pieces for us. Well, not for us, but at least in this instance, Nicola was nice enough to uh, gift this to us. We've also supported um, museum and art gallery uh, displays. And one of the larger ones was in 2010 at the local gallery here. You can see a lot of our uh, of models here, Steger's, the, uh, the Ziegler waxes, there's the, the Cunningham heads got pictures, more waxes, and uh, there's our Dermato man, etc. cetera. Uh, and our Ozu man lying in state. And then very quickly, just to finish up before one last treat, hopefully for you. Um, of course, the media are always very keen to use the museum as a backdrop uh, when they're presenting stories on uh, medicine or science. And some of you may remember uh, the then Prime Minister's visit uh, last year. I know we're pushed for time, um, so thank you for your tolerance thus far, but I would like to share one last technological development, if hopefully, fingers crossed, technology will allow me. In 2020, Ruth started her PhD, February 2020, March 2020, I'm sure you all remember, uh, was it March, April, we went into lockdown. Uh, Ruth had to come up with how, how she was going to approach her, her PhD. So, um, with a considerable amount of work and support of uh, Jeff Avery from SciComm, we created a virtual uh, museum. So, I'm going to hopefully show this to you now. Right, here we go. Apologies to people on Zoom. It may be quite glitchy for you coming through. Welcome to the WD Trotter Anatomy. You've already heard all that. So here we have it. This is the Anatomy Museum. Uh, so the idea was that uh, since people could not come, to the museum, we would present it to them. Uh, and Ruth went about uh, collecting data from people. And uh, once we were able to work through them experiencing 
uh, this virtual visit when we were all allowed to get back together again. Uh, we invited people if they were in town or where they could, they were then able to come in and uh, Ruth was able to do a comparison on the experience of people uh, from a, a, a virtual and, and whether it was also 2D was it images and so from a book versus a sort of a model and then versus a plast in it, so the real thing and do that both virtually and then uh, in person. But as you can see, this is now quite a, 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 an exciting little resource for us to have um, and to be able to think forward into the future how we might be able to integrate this in allowing um, people uh, or our students in to, to get access to the resource. So I'll just show you very quickly. I talked about the uh, patho uh, pathology collection before. So these are some of the uh, pathology specimens that we have now. The students they can come and have a look at these um, uh, during their tutorials uh, get access to things so there we have it thank you very much uh, and happy father's day on sunday to all those fathers out there thanks uh, questions first of all i'm going to uh, leap in with one Early on, you showed the um, fascinating first house of Koi, the one that's now on George Street, um, and it's a restaurant. So can you tell us a bit more about that house and its, its story? Yeah, I was intrigued by the top level with those very, this very unusual roof. Yes, very French, well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The sectoring roof. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. And the only reason I know is that Fika uh, somehow discovered um, that- Fika Newman. Fika Newman discovered a few years back um, when we were doing a talk. Um, yeah, she somehow found yeah. out that that was, that he had specifically built that as, a, you know, as his home at some yes. stage. So I'm not sure of the dates either, but- um, I'm sure there'll be information somewhere about uh, yeah, it. Yeah, so given that he went on to have a career at the hospital, um, and obviously that's only a block away from the hospital, mm. it was an mm. ideal site to have your home. Interesting. Just a comment, uh, you, you uh, questioned about that house. Shortly after I came to Dunedin, late 1970s, that house was a restaurant upstairs right at the top in that wooden dome but it was quite a fancy place it was very nice actually we had often had staff dues up there thanks uh, i was interested to hear you talk about derek denny brown who became a major neurological figure worldwide what years was sort of he involved and what was his role when he was involved with the anatomy museum and that uh, so denny brown uh, had been a student he then went on to uh, be a demonstrator. So there was quite a bit of work. I think the, the, the brain uh, wax piece that I showed you there. I, well, I'm a neurologist. So Denny Brown has spent many years at uh, Boston City Hospital and Harvard. And back in the late 40s, he was one of the people who sort of first published on various perineoplastic neurological syndromes. So that was one of his main sort of... Uh, Aim, uh, my main sort of causes yeah, so of aim. The the um, the notes that I was reading from were from uh, Gowland's uh, publication in 1928. So it, it was at least yes, I think it was so. It was like 1925 when he was doing a lot of the the, the research work as a student, or as a demonstrator, and those models were produced. Uh, and then, so at this stage in 28, um, Denny Brown is referred to by Gowland as being at Oxford for the last few years. So yes, um, so that was sort of that, that period. So I think that photo of him later on in 69, that was his only visit that he ever had back um, when he came back to the department. Yeah. Well, I have, I have Denny Brown's notes, student notes, I've got, um, all his books, all hand, yeah, handwritten, and all, all his illustrations. It's quite, 
quite fascinating. Yeah. Chris, who has access to the virtual museum? Um, that is something that we're trying to, to work out again, because it was done as a particular project. Um, and then given, given legislation and you know, how we have to manage um, various things, it needs to be, we need to figure out how to manage that. But we're hoping it used to be under our control um, and now it's it's actually controlled by university ITS. It's on one of their own servers and, and managed by them. So we have to now go you know, process that through through them. So we were just talking about it yesterday, the day before. We want to try and set up uh, uh, an easier path for us to simply just have uh, you know, the means of saying, here you go, you can access on this. Um, you know, because it has to be password and all that sort of thing. So yeah. Chris, uh, thank you very much for a, a, a beautiful presentation. Um, I have a very fond uh, memories and connection of the Anatomy Museum because I spent many hours studying there. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you a personal question if I'm allowed to. When you walk through the door of the Anatomy Museum, you basically enter history and you are curator. What are your feelings every morning when you go to work? How do you feel in that place of history? Thank you. Um, yes, I admit it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's quite remarkable in general what this, uh, if, you, if you imagine, say, the medical school itself, what it contains in its um, collections and archives, etc. So knowing, of course, that we're working towards the 150th next year, um, I'm part of the committee for that, and we, you know we're obviously trying to, to bring all those stories together. And just wading through um, all of that material, I, I'm also associated with the uh, OMSA, so the Medical Alumni Association, Secretary Treasurer, and so you know, I've got sort of ready access to all that material too. And it is amazing what we have. Uh, so it, it is, it is, it's, it is neat. Um, to, to come into that sort of space each day and to have such a varied uh, and historic collection around. Um, but one, one that has those immediate personal elements to it too, the fact that, as I said, you know, we've got Denny Brown's notebooks. I mean, just the fact that the, there are these actual real human relatable things um, and that there are certain people that have, have produced or, you know, been involved. It is. It's quite special. Yeah. Hello, John. John Holmes. We remember dining in that rest in that house after two thousand. So it was still going when we came to New Dunedin in two thousand. It was still a restaurant. Oh right. It was a nice. It was nice as Gil, as Gil said. It's a nice venue. Camelot. Right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I just would like to ask you about, um, you mentioned um, the models uh, that you show us was uh, actually Lenin and uh, Stalin. Yes. Uh, so have you follow up other works by the same artist uh, that um, he's always doing famous characters in these models or just the two are unique ones? Yes, I, I think from, certainly from what we have in our collection, um, they are the only ones that are presented like that. Most of the other work that he was uh, doing was with Pickerel uh, at the dental school. And so they were actually uh, you know, presenting physical clinical things. Um, so probably the real people rather than being able to you know, sort of manufacture. Uh, so certainly that's all I'm familiar with, yeah. No other questions? Ruth, there are no other questions. Please join me in thanking Chris for a wonderful presentation.